In this video, we're going to talk about potential private solution to the externality problem. And this is called the Coase theorem, named after the, the economist who came up with this idea. And here, the notion, or, or Coase's insight, was that the reason we're getting the inefficient level of production is because nobody has the property rights for whatever it is that is is suffering the pollution. So a good example we use is, what if there is a, a river or a lake that's being polluted? Okay, and so you can think about, well, what if there's a paper mill? Okay? Uh, and so you have a paper mill, and it's putting pollutants into a lake, and, or into a river that's then going into a lake. And so what that's doing is it's harming the, the fish and other wildlife around there. And so then fishermen are not able to get as much enjoyment out of going and fishing there because, well, there's just not as many healthy fish for them to go catch. Or, you know, what if people are using that for drinking water, which hopefully they wouldn't be, uh, because usually we have separate sources where we're not, people are not allowed to dump things into our, our reservoirs. Um, whatever the scenario we're thinking about, so Kosa's insight was, well, you know, what if you assigned the property rights over that, over that lake? So in other words, you could say, hey, we're going to turn this into uh, a park and we'll give ownership of the lake to whoever is, is managing the park. And so their benefit from a clean lake or for how clean the lake is, right, is depends on how much people are then willing to come in and fish and camp and, and use the, the lake. Uh, alternatively, and so, so what's, what's the key there is then the paper mill would have to pay the owners of the park, the owners of the lake, for the right to pollute. Now, alternatively, you could actually assign the property rights to the paper mill, in which case the people who run the, the campgrounds using the lake for the campgrounds would have to pay the paper mill to reduce po pollution. Now, his insight is that actually it doesn't matter to whom you assign the property rights. In either case, you should get the efficient level of pollution. Okay. Now, what do I mean by the efficient level of pollution? All right, some of you might be thinking, well, isn't zero the efficient level of pollution? Well, no, it's not. Because it's, it's impossible for us to not have any kind of, of impact on the environment without basically knocking out all economic activity. All right. What we mean by efficient level of pollution is, well, we, we analyze that, again, using a supply and demand graph. Except now here, what we have Right, our quantity here is being measured in terms of the reduction in the pollutant. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about, uh, kind of go think, think back to the example we had in the previous video, the negative externality with pollution being generated, uh, created when we, when we generate electricity. And as I mentioned, right, sulfur dioxide, or SO2, is one of the, the big uh, pollutants that, that is a negative byproduct of generating electricity. So note here we have, here's our marginal benefit curve. And this is the marginal benefit of reducing SO2, right? Reducing sulfur dioxide emissions. And here is the marginal cost of reducing emissions, right? So at zero, there would be no abatement in sulfur dioxide. Okay? So as we're moving from left to right, we're talking about greater and greater reductions, right? So left to right is a, a more a cleaner environment. So make sure you, you pay close attention to that, what we're, how, we're, how we're analyzing this, OK? Now, what did we mean by the efficient level of, of pollution? And why, why isn't it zero, right? Why do, wouldn't it be zero? So I mean, zero pollution would be you know, maybe if the maximum, if the total amount of pollution was, say, 20 million, right? That would be somewhere all the way out here. I'm sure I'll go ahead and let's say 16, so it's a little more to scale. So if that's the case, well, why why won't we just abate all all of the the SO2 pollution? Well, if you look at it, right, the marginal benefit in terms of the value to society of cleaning up that last unit, right, eliminating that last unit of sulfur dioxide, is much much lower than the cost of reducing that sulfur dioxide. Right? 
So what is the efficient level of reduction? Well, as always, it's where marginal benefit intersects marginal cost. Okay? And say, so, well, why, why is this, this efficient? So let's say, let's take as an example, let's say we are already abating seven, um, was it tons of, of sulfur dioxide per year. Uh, the question is, well, is it worthwhile to abate an extra one and a half tons, right? Should we be going from seven to eight and a half tons of, of abatement per year, you know, reduction in sulfur dioxide emissions? Well, if we look at this, right, what is the marginal benefit of that additional reduction, of those 1.5 tons? The marginal benefit, again, is given by our curve up here, right, but the marginal cost is only down here. Right? Another way of looking at it is we can label, if we take this whole area here, right, we can think of this uh, one that I'm outlining in the green. Okay. Just really make sure it's clear to you what area we're highlighting here. Right, and we can split this up into two, two areas. We have A, which is this, this triangle here, and then B. Right, so B is the area below the marginal cost curve between 7 and 8.5, and, and A is the area between the marginal cost and marginal benefit curves between 7 and 8.5. And so what is the total benefit of increasing our SO2 reduction from 7 to 8.5 tons? The total benefit in going from 7 to 8.5 tons of reduction is area A plus B. Right? It's the area under the marginal benefit curve. Right? So for any of you who've, who've done differential calculus, right, who know how to do uh, integration, Right? If this curve, this is the marginal benefit curve, right? so total benefit is the area under the curve between our two quantities. So the total benefit of reducing, increasing our reduction from 7 to 8.5 tons is A plus B. Well, what is the total cost of reducing, right, increasing the reduction in SO2 from 7 to 8.5 tons? That's the area below the marginal cost curve, which is just B. Right, so what is the net benefit of increasing our SO2 reduction from 7 to 8.5? And, well, that's area A. Right? So, and you can really say this for any, right, any quantity between 0 and 8.5 and tons, right, anywhere where the marginal benefit of increasing our reduction, right, or reducing even more SO2, reducing the pollution by more, for the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost, it is worthwhile to society for us to right, pursue an even cleaner environment. But once we get beyond 8.5 tons of right, reduction of SO2, well, at that point, the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit. And here, it's important to bear in mind, what do we mean by the marginal cost? Right? We have to put resources into cleaning up right, the SO2 reduction. I, either we have to use technologies that clean up and maybe capture the SO2 before it's emitted out into the environment, but that raises the cost of electricity for households. And so that is a cost there. Or we could, of course, just say, let's not use as much electricity. But again, that is, that's going to be a cost for society. Right? And we weigh those against the benefits of the cleaner environment. And again, as I said in the previous video, it's not always clear how we try to put a dollar value on, right, on the marginal benefits. And even sometimes, it's, it's hard for us to, to know exactly what the costs will be. Uh, so we try to make, right, make our, our best, uh, best estimates and design policy from there. Now, one final note on the Coase theorem. In order for the Coase theorem to work, we have, we have two conditions. One is that the property rights have to be enforceable. Right, so what do we mean? Well, so in this case, if you go back to the, 
uh, you know, if we think about an example like this, so you have utilities companies that are generating electricity, well, you know, the U.S. government has the ability to enforce property rights. Of course, that means that the government has to have the ability to monitor the sulfur dioxide emissions. Right? If we can't monitor the emissions, if we don't know what's going on there, then how are we going to enforce the kind of general property rights over cleaner air? And same thing if we go back to the example with the lake and the paper mill. Right? Somebody has to be able to enforce those rights. Now, in that case, you know, if the property rights if are on the lake uh, belong to the, to the individuals who own the lake and are running the, the campgrounds, well, then they can go to the government and, and sue, if, sue the paper mill if, there's, right, if they're seeing there's more pollution being kicked in than, than was agreed upon. Other examples, though, we also have where property rights are not really enforceable is, well, what about the oceans? Right? If we have an externality, right, so if we have, you know, we talk about overfishing in, in the oceans or if people are dumping pollution into the oceans, well, who, who enforces property rights in the Pacific or the Atlantic? And so that, those are scenarios where the Coase theorem really won't work because we, we don't have the ability to actually enforce property rights. The other thing is that we need low transaction costs. And you think back to the example with the paper mill, and this again goes back to actually what I alluded to already is this, this notion of, well, we have to know right, how much pollution is being put in there. So if the campground owners can't see how much pollution the paper mill is putting into, into the lake, well, then they don't really know if, if the terms of the agreement are being violated or not. And so you need low transaction costs, is that both sides need to be able to clearly and transparently see the amount of pollution that's being kicked out. And we also have to have a notion of, of what these, these benefits and these costs are as well. If either of these two conditions don't hold, then the course coast theorem won't work. Right? Next, we're going to turn to government solution for dealing with externalities.